Welcome to the stage from Analog Devices, Mr. Joe Barry, Vice President, Systems and Technologies. Good morning. Uh, welcome to Analog Devices Partner Program. Really excited to have you all here today. Um, we've met at its day three. We're halfway there. Let's keep going. Uh, what, a, what an exciting show. But just to get going on, on, on the topic, you know, we've got a very, very exciting topic today and a very distinguished guest here to speak about you know, the, the dawn of industrial 5G. Um, just to get started, I want to give a brief introduction to analog devices and what we're doing in terms of um, this challenge that lays ahead of the industry. So very quickly, um, analog devices is a leading semiconductor company that we're really focused on how we would create a more connected, safer, and sustainable future for us all. And that is built on the back of our focus around customers and partnerships and how vital they are in terms of what we do and how we co-create to solve some of the world's most difficult challenges. Uh, obviously, you know, we're very much focused on innovation and we invest very heavily in terms of our technology and our talent to create that future. But just to think about where ADI operates we like to think about our position in the world in terms of the physical world and digital world and bridging that section of how you think about it. So it's from at the very edge, you know, we have to measure something, we have to interpret that, we have to analyze that through measurement, through algorithmic kind of computation, add intelligence. We need to be able to connect that to uh, the expansion of the edge. And we do that very much focused on power and sustainability, because I think that's one of the big trends we see in terms of the challenge across industry in general and many different markets is how do we solve and how do we create a future that's more sustainable. So just a very quick history lesson, because I think a lot can be garnered from the insight of history and how industries have transformed over time. And we go back to kind of, you know, what has enabled uh, the innovation and the transformation within those. So if we go back to the dawn of 1G and the evolution of voice to data and how, how, how that's evolved, you know, we, can, we can see that in the past. If we look to today, we're very much you know, in the mass adoption of and implementation of how we look at industries in terms of communication um, and you know we can see that transformation in terms of how it's playing out in the automotive industry how it's playing out in kind of 5g infrastructure energy that's driving you know focused on the transformation of electrification it's focused on more safety more connected services we see the emergence of a very strong open ecosystem with oran and then we look to the next frontier, which is really the main topic which we want to talk about today, which is really how do we bring you know, this transformation at the industrial and broader edge, where we can focus on the challenges around more automation, more autonomy, higher security, more sustainable production uh, throughout the world. We look at the transformation in terms of, you know, energy, smart grids, digitization of the grid, adding more intelligence. So a very big focus uh, is ahead of us in terms of this frontier, but I think we're on the cusp of you know, very significant breakthroughs and progress. So when you kind of consider ADI, analog devices, you know, we like to look at this in terms of two different industries. One is our IT industry, uh, the other one is our OT industry, our operational technology. And you know, ADI has a long history and lineage in terms of working all the way through on the IT side, or ICT, from 1G, 2G, 3G, 4G, 5G. Very, very deep domain knowledge experience, both from our RF radio solution technology, our, our insights around uh, AI and machine learning solutions. Then if you look at ADI in terms of our industrial um, play in our industrial lineage. You know, we've over 50 years of experience working on industry through the transformation of industry to Industry 4.0 and 
I think we're on the kind of second phase of transformation in Industry 4.0 in terms of how do we bring more intelligence, more, auto more autonomy, more sustainability into that industry. So these are two worlds that typically have existed in isolation. There's kind of been a firewall between IT and OT worlds. But as we see the need for the adoption of 5G technology and industrial application, at ADI, we're very much focused on how do we bridge, you know, having the domain expertise and knowledge and insight and partnerships with our customers uh, in both industries. We're very much focused on bridging that divide. Um, and so uh, with that, I'm going to just play a very short video from 5G ACIA, which, which is really focused on uh, this challenge across the industry. The future of industry has arrived. Digitalization is advancing quickly and generating enormous new value with Industry 4.0. This has set the stage for industrial 5G. By networking machines and systems, it's paving the way for the factories of the future. We, the 5G Alliance for Connected Industries and Automation, are creating the framework of industrial 5G. The members of 5G ACIA include automation, telecommunications, and semiconductor companies, as well as universities and research institutions. We're developing the tools for industry worldwide to unlock its full potential. This involves defining use cases and their requirements, as well as creating the framework for a scalable ecosystem. Collaboration across domains is essential for effectively integrating mobile communications into industry. Global cooperation is also vital. 5G ACIA has therefore forged a unique worldwide network as the basis for a major new market with huge potential. Join 5G ACIA and participate in the new marketplace for industrial 5G. Help us drive change and redefine industry. Um, I would now like to, I'm excited to introduce our distinguished guest, Dr. Andres Muller, who's the General Chair of 5G ACIA. Thank you, Andre. Andres. Yeah, good morning, everyone. And uh, good to see you here today. Thanks for coming and for taking your time and um, have the pleasure to talk about a very exciting topic, um, industrial 5G. So thanks a lot also to Analog Devices for the kind invitation and for giving us the opportunity to give you an overview um, of where we are with 5G in the manufacturing industry. And it's not the first time that we are talking about industrial 5G. The topic has been around for a couple of years already. But as it's sometimes the case in life, right? Sometimes it takes a bit um, longer to put things from theory to practice. But the good news is also with Industrial 5G, we are on a very good way now after a lot of preparatory work that we have been doing in the last couple of years to really put it into practice. And I will start with the vision that we already had when we also started 5G SIA in 2018. So I had a very similar slide in 2018. It didn't look as nice as this one, but the key message was the same, right? So we have the two different worlds, and Joe also um, outlined this in his short introduction, the OT industry and the ICT, the IT industry. And in 2018, we have seen, okay, there are two major trends going on in these two, two different industries at the same time. On the one hand, the developments towards Industry 4.0, so the digital transformation of the manufacturing industry, if you want, and on the other hand, 5G was coming up at Horizon. And of course, 5G had a promise to not just provide higher data rates and better connectivity, but many new things like low latency, high reliability, and so on. And then it was very straightforward to say, okay, let's just bring these two developments together and see if we can use 5G in the manufacturing industry, in the automation industry, to lift Industry 4.0 to the next level. We don't need 5G for Industry 4.0, so that started long before the developments um, of 5G. But with 5G 
And that's still true today, right? There's a lot of potential to increase the flexibility, the productivity, the efficiency, and also the ease of use. So that's on a very high level the vision and the potential of 5G in manufacturing. So that's the vision. Where are we today? Right. And here, if you look just at the market, and it's just a qualitative picture, so don't try to compare the bars with each other. But of course, the main business, if you look at 5G, is still the consumer business. If you go here at Mobile Progress and see there are many new phones being announced, uh, uh, the network operators um, telling you about AI and things like this. So that's still where the main business is. And the industrial domain or the vertical domains in general are still lagging a bit behind. So it's not comparable yet. It's not zero, so that's the good news already. Right? But it's not exactly where we thought it would be in 2024 as we are here today. So that's why a question that comes up from time to time is, OK, was it just a big hype? And after all, nothing coming out of that. And let's have a look at what we have done, been doing so far, and maybe where we are and where we'll be heading with industrial 5G. So when we also started 5G SIA, the first thing we were doing, apart from trying to get a common understanding and speak the same languages, we looked a lot into use cases and requirements. So what can we really do with 5G for industrial automation? And there are many use cases and requirements that we have identified. Right? So some examples are shown here. Of course, whenever you have moving devices, if you have portable devices, if you have things that are rotating, and so on. So then the wireless connectivity is always a must, basically. You cannot connect an automated guided vehicle with a cable. So intralogistics, therefore, is a natural application area. Also, if we have large areas that we want to cover, like in the process industry, maybe with harsh environments, right? So then you really have significant costs for the cabling. So connecting wireless sensors and actuators here is a big topic. Human-machine interaction, be it using some mobile control panels or using augmented reality devices and so on. Also here for an optimal um, usability, you want to have wireless connectivity, smart tools, the same thing, portable devices. Also modular production is a big topic. So industry 4.0 is all about really unprecedented levels of flexibility that we can easily reconfigure a production line and maybe have modular units that we can rearrange and then um, change what we are producing from one day to the other. And of course, we don't have to care about the cabling then this makes our life a lot easier. Also, retrofitting is always something very relevant because we have very long lifetimes of machines. So it's not just two years, like for a smartphone. It's 10 years, 15 years, 20 years in the process industry, even longer. So that's why there is a value in being able to easily upgrade existing machines. For example, by putting some wireless sensors here and there, then we can extract data, we can make use of AI, and then, again, increase the value. And also find my something, that's what I call it here, is basically about positioning. So knowing where things are is in general a very valuable information in manufacturing. And if you can get the position of a device using the same infrastructure that we will have anyway for connecting devices, of course it reduces the complexity and um, uh, in increases basically the, the, or reduces the total cost of ownership. And there are many more, so just some examples, but. I think now we have a very good understanding of what are general use cases, also what are the requirements, and also we have done a lot of work for bringing these use cases and requirements to 3GPP, for example. If you look at the requirements, uh, of course there are very special requirements. In manufacturing, it's not just about higher data rates. There are also use cases where you need higher data rates, but it's more than that. And I think there's a very good understanding of quite a number of requirements. And some examples are given here. So these are the obvious ones, basically quality or service related requirements. Right? So for many applications, we need low latency, high reliability. This was somehow the starting point with a promise that 5G will offer one millisecond latency, five or six nines communication service availability. And this is something you need for closed loop control applications, for example. Then the integrated positioning, I mentioned this already. If you can use the same infrastructure for knowing where is your automated guided vehicle or maybe just knowing where is your robot that provides value. Currently, often other technologies are used for this. Edge computing is a very hot topic, not just combined with 5G, but also independent of 5G. But of course, if we have edge computing, then it should seamlessly work together so that we can offload, for example, 
um, intelligence for a machine vision or for a PLC, a programmable logic controller and so on, so that it's getting more and more virtualized and running then on a central edge cloud in a factory with high connectivity and high performance connectivity to sensors and actuators feeding the control loop, for example. Coverage is a huge topic and maybe that's where we see already most traction in the market today. So in the process industry, if you have a big chemical plant um, or if you have an, a big industrial area, right, where it's simply more economical to deploy 5G rather than other wireless technologies like Wi-Fi. So then you have a business case already from the number of base stations that you need compared to the number of access points that you would require. It is not just the devices themselves, it's also the cabling effort, the maintenance effort, and so on. So that easily gives you a positive business case. Good quality of service support in general, right? It's not just su supporting one use case with one specific set of requirements. In a factory, of course, we have many different use cases with very diverse requirements. And we want to use some of them at the same time. So that's why dependability is a key topic that 5G promises. Time-sensitive networking, a huge one as well. So TSN is a big development also for wired communication with time synchronization, time aware, shapers, time aware scheduling, and things like this. And 5G now has to promise to support this out of the box with TSN over 5G. So this allows them a very seamless integration into um, the existing environment that we have. And finally, also other things like seamless authentication um, and aspects like this. This always depends on the case, but there is um, strong uh, demand from some players at least to also support things like this. So. I think many things should be well known already. And if you look at here at a state of um, play, right, it looks very good and very promising. So the standards support a lot of this, especially the 16, really 17 in HPP had a strong focus on the industrial IoT. And I think here I'm not really concerned about missing support of the features in the standards. However, there are also not so obvious requirements, right? And this is not so much about quality of service in a strict sense. It's more about other aspects that play an important role. And it starts with simplicity. So simplicity, how much effort is it to operate such a 5G network in a factory, for example? Right? I mean, of course, mobile technology is coming from the, from the classical MNOs, the mobile network operators. They have special experts. They have big teams operating a network. It needs to be extremely scalable. We don't need all of this for a private network in a factory. It's a much smaller setting, and it's typically more the IT guys that are responsible for it that have to be able to deal with it. So simplicity is key, so that we reduce the complexity to an extent that also an IT department can handle it. We need also a good return on invests. That's always the driving aspect of manufacturing, right? So it has to provide significantly more value than it costs, and we need a payback period which is reasonable, so the shorter the better, for years maybe as the, the standard value as a maximum. So if it's 10 years or so, then it might be very hard to convince the plant owner. Um, rich exposure interfaces is another important topic, especially for the integration in the existing IT environment, so the capabilities of the 5G system should be exposed that we can easily configure quality of service flows and things like this. And there's a lot of work going on and has been um, going on already towards this. Investment security is very important as well. So if we are further evolving the technology, that there's a smooth transition, that there's no disruption, and at some point I have to take all the equipment out of a factory again and buy new stuff and so on. So of course there can be upgrades, there should be an evolution, but it should be backwards compatible. Also, typically, manufacturers don't like vendor login, so we need open solutions, we need modular solutions that you can easily also change vendors and work with other partners. Um, manufacturers want to be independent, right, so that you can have everything under your own control that you need to run your factory, to run your operations, and that you can also act as you like. And finally, we should not forget it's 5G is not alone in the world. There are other technologies around. There is a lot of wired communication today in the factory. There is a lot of Wi-Fi today in a factory, and that's the competition, the benchmark. Of course, 5G is the better technology. I think that's fair to say, but it also is a little bit more expensive, typically, than Wi-Fi. And therefore, we have to make sure, if you want to um, make industrial 5G a success, that it's a significant value add compared to a Wi-Fi system as we have it today, for instance.
And of course, there are more than this, but hopefully this gives you a little bit of feeling of what is important apart from this very um, uh, support for demanding requirements and so on. And a key aspect always are private networks. Right? So this was something that has been discussed from the early days of industrial 5G. If you have a factory, you do not want to rely typically on a public network. And it also does not make too much sense somehow to use the public network that we're using for our mobile phones. Right? And there are different reasons for this. It's very local, what you need, the communication. It's in a factory, in, in a plant of the process industry, for example. Um, at the same time, we have this very demanding quality of service requirements. And sometimes this contradicts with the way you would optimize a public network. We have more uplink traffic typically than downlink traffic, so it's about what are the optimal TDD ratios and so on. Um, and uh, of course, a factory is also a controlled environment. That means if you have something in the factory, you can make sure you have the coverage where you need it, you have the quality of service as you need it, uh, positioning and so on. So it's much more flexible and easy, easier than to fine tune it in the optimal way. Of course, there are also special security concerns, right? So it's always a concern in manufacturing, not specific to 5G. You want to keep control of the data and make sure the data is um, not going somewhere that is out of your control, and we need this need the high flexibility. As I mentioned before, Industry 4.0 is all about flexibility, so that we, in the extreme case, have lot size of one. No product is like another one. It's still a vision, um, even today, but um, if you want to get there, we have to be able to easily reconfigure the production, and of course, this may also imply reconfiguring the network and the quality of service that the network supports. And also, this is much easier if you have it under your own control as a manufacturer. So that's, um, these are driving factors for these private networks. And of course, there's a huge momentum now behind private networks. I think that's fair to say. Also, if you look at Mobile World Congress here, many um, players are showing something on private networks, be it uh, dedicated small cells, be it uh, core networks, be it services, and so on. And it's not black and white, right? So it's not either you use a public network and then mobile network operator takes care of it, or you set up a complete network on your own in your factory. There are now many different flavors, what this could look like. We've analyzed this in 5G SRA um, a couple of years ago already. There's a nice white paper, and there can be different levels of collaboration between more traditional MNOs, system integrators, and the factory owners themselves. And from a from the perspective of an end user, that's a good thing because then you have a choice. You have different options and you can say, okay, this is the best one for me or this one. And my personal um, uh, view on this is that there will also be this variety of different options, depending on whether you are a small company, a big company and so on, one or the other might be better. So where are we with private networks today? So that gives us a good indication maybe where we also are with uh, industrial 5G in general. Of course, private networks are also used in other areas but still manufacturing is a key driver here. And these are some statistics that I took from GSA. So they are trying to keep an overview of private network deployments around the world. Um, we have to be careful here because the last one is only up to the third quarter of 2023. So if you take the entire year, it would be even higher. Right? And of course, what we see here is basically exponential growth, which is a good thing. If you look at the absolute numbers, I would not really bet on this. My personal conviction is the absolute numbers are significantly higher. And that's also one of the challenges here because it's not so easy to track private networks. Right? So it's, uh, for public networks, you know what the network operators are doing. It's very easy to see and so on. For private networks, not everybody is telling this the world. Right? And even the networks that I'm aware of somehow so would be uh, very close to what we see here. So that's why the absolute numbers probably are much higher. But what is important here is the trend, the development, and it's exponential growth, it's taking off, and that's a good thing. Um, but at the same time, it's still a bit behind original expectations, so also when we started 5G SAA in 2018, so I was much more confident about the status quo in 2024, where we are now. But it's also quite, well, it should not be so surprising, actually, if you look at the details, and that's what I would like to outline here and on the next slides. Right? So, what you see here is a typical process if you come up with something like industrial 5G. We start with the vision. My first slide was the vision. So I think that's all done. Then you do use cases requirements, also here, we're in a good way. Then you do the standards, you specify things. Then it's being implemented in the chipsets, in the infrastructure, 
we need services to support this. Then we can get the devices integrating the chipsets, the modules. And devices in the industrial domain are then robots, automated guided vehicles, uh, PLCs, and things like this. Then it's being deployed, and then the actual monetization starts. So it's a process, and it takes time. So the first three things, vision is clear, requirements, I think rather well understood. It's still a moving target, of course. We always get new requirements, and there are also new capabilities. So we are never done, but I think we have a good basis now. Basically, a good understanding and the specifications, as I mentioned, up to release 17 looks pretty good. We have red cap, things like this. Now, with release 17, there are some further optimizations in release 18. But release 17, from this point of view of the specifications, is already really very nice. If you look at the implementation, we are not fully there yet, I would say. Right? So, not everything that has been specified in the standards has been implemented in the chipsets and infrastructure side, the same thing, but maybe it's a bit easier there. But we see it's increasing, and REDCap is a good example. So REDCap provides you a better cost-benefit ratio somehow, so it might be suitable for um, industrial cameras, for uh, sensors and actuators, and of course at a lower price point than a full-blown mobile broadband 5G module, which still is a bit expensive. Um, and then, of course, it's similar for the other things in the chain, right? So the devices, device ecosystem is growing. Um, we will provide an overview in 5G SI here at the Hannover Messe in April with some of the devices that are already there, that our members have. And you see more and more devices coming, um, coming up here um, uh, from month to month, basically. But also, this is still growing, so it's not that we have a 1,000 industrial 5G devices yet, right? But of course, this is a very important um, so that also then factory owners get started because if you don't have devices, then maybe you don't deploy a private 5G network in your factory. So also this is lagging behind, but we see more and more networks being built up um, and also more and more networks beyond the PUC phase. Um, and what I mentioned at the beginning, coverage, for example, is a key driver at this point in time simply because then you have a business case just by comparing it to, to your Wi-Fi costs um, that you have today. And then monetization, of course, is the last point, basically. That's, of course, what we are all aiming for, what drives us. Um, but here we are still in this, um, this uh, ramp up phase right now. So what is important to understand here, and this is now a different view on what I basically just said, um, is that it takes time, right? And it takes even more time for topics like industrial 5G. What you see here, are the typical cycles that we have. So starting with the standards, FGBP. So typically we have a new release of FGBP every 18 months or so, 18 to 24 months. And it started with release 15, the first 5G release. Currently we are now working on release 19. Um, and the roadmap I think is pretty clear. So if there's something that is very reliable, then it's the, the cycles of FGBP. For the consumer devices, right, so it always depends. Um, I just did some, some quick uh, search, and Google told me, okay, the typical duration somebody is using a mobile phone is about a bit, little bit more than two years, two and a half years maybe. Some of you maybe replace it more often, others less often, but let's say two and a half years for a new smartphone. But that's the ICT world. If we now compare this to the OT side of things, right? so then we have much longer cycles. If you look at an industrial robot, here, the typical duration is 10 years or even more. Right? Only after 10 years, you replace a robot and maybe um, buy a new one. And if you look at the process industry, which is even in the industrial domain, one of the more conservative sectors, right? so then it might be 20 years, 30 years for big machines and so on. And this means it simply takes this time to get things being introduced. Right? If there's a new release, it's not that you can say, OK, then I have the next smartphone coming up. Um, half a year later, and then the new features are in there, um, you would not always be able also to directly integrate these new things into your de industrial devices and so on. And this is part of the reason why it simply takes a bit more time. So and it's this chicken egg challenge that we have, of course, right? Um, I mean, we have this in different areas. Um, so there's a the question is always, what is first, the chicken or the egg, right? So and the chicken said, okay, if there's no egg, then there can be no chicken. But if there's no chicken, then there can be no egg. And that's somehow um, a problem we have to deal with. 
And we see this in different respects also for industrial 5G. So as long as there are no industrial 5G devices, there's little value that a manufacturer can unlock, and there's no, then no incentive to set up a private 5G network in the factory. And if you don't have a private 5G network in a factory, if no customer has 5G, there's little incentive for a vendor of an industrial robot, for example, to come up with a 5G version. Right, so, and that's part of a chicken egg challenge, but it's also, if you look, um, for example, at the implementation of features, right? So currently, not all the features have been implemented in chipsets, and as a chipset vendor, maybe you do also your calculation. I sell billions of chips to the smartphone industry, and how many industrial robots will there be, or might there be? Of course, it's not billions, at least not from day one. So I'm, there's no big market yet, no huge market yet, and that's why it's maybe not a top priority. But if there are never, chips available supporting all these nice things, then there will never be a big market. Right? Also, this is a chicken egg challenge. And what is the solution to this? The solution is we have to work together as an ecosystem to get over this, right? And to get over the chicken egg challenge. We have to bring all the players together and then we have to make, make small steps. And then we get some more devices, we get more deployments. And so step by step, we can get over this. And this is Part of the work and the goals we are doing in 5G is A to bring all the players together, the OT industry, the ICT industry, and to jointly work on different aspects here. These are the working groups that we are currently having. Since I'm running late already, I will um, be very brief here. So we are yeah, bringing together many different stakeholders. As of today, we have 96 member organizations. We're also very happy that Analog Devices uh, joined us last year, I think. And uh, we just introduced also a new membership category at the beginning of this year to especially attract end users. So they were still missing a little bit. We had some end users and some players also have double roles. Um, but of course, to get over this chicken egg challenge, we need the end users as well. That's why we introduced a new membership category. So you can, if you are an end user, if you have a factory that you're running, you are more than welcome to join us at a reduced rate. And we are very happy that Equinor, so the Norwegian oil and gas company, is now the first company that has the status of an end user that just joined us in uh, a couple of weeks ago. And uh, we are in discussions with many more. So I'm very confident that we will be growing very soon. So in 5G SIA, just some words here about what we are doing. We celebrated our fifth anniversary last year at the Hannover Messe, the Mobile World Congress of the OT industry, if you want. Um, was a big event. Um, there was something last year called the 5G Arena, so a central place in Hannover for industrial 5G, where many different companies are showcasing their products, their solutions, with a lot of discussions, interactions, presentations, and so on. So it was a, a huge success, I would say, and that's why we are doing the same thing again this year in, in April. Also, we are going um, around the world, right? We have this global ambition to bring all the stakeholders together on a global basis. We were in Taipei in December last year. We also had a nice exhibition with more than 25 exhibitors, companies from Taiwan, but also from all around the world, right? And also they're showing their products, their solutions, their visions, and so on. And also this helps, of course, and is important for the ecosystem development. And um, we are continuing this. Um, also this year, um, and coming to your region as well. What we're also doing to support this is the testbed program that we have. So, and that's always, yeah, once you have the ideas, the use cases, and some of the features, you want to test it. And of course, in, especially in manufacturing, without testing, you will not use it, right? You need the confidence that it's really working as expected, that it gives you the benefits that you're expected in the beginning. And that's why we set up this testbed program a couple of years ago already. We have uh, 10 about 10 5G SRA testbeds so far, looking into different areas, different partners can come together, set something up, evaluate it, and then share some of the insights with the other members. Some examples are shown here. Uh, we went into semiconductor production, for example, which is very specific. Um, material handling, again, is a very different thing if you have this uh, interlogistics, the cranes, and so on, so different requirements. Open run is a topic um, that some members looked into together with positioning and so on. So really different topics and it's very important to understand this and to get these practical insights. Right? And again, a big step and important step towards um, uh, ecosystem development. So what is next now? What is still to be done to 
make sure this exponential growth that we are seeing now in the early days while it's continuing and that we really achieve the Industrial 5G vision. Ecosystem development is one of the key aspects with these small steps that we have to do together. We need more end-to-end -end solutions. Um, so 5G on its own does not solve any problem. It's a technology, right? And you have to combine the technology and 5G with other building blocks like edge computing, maybe AI, um, also then the sensors and actuators and so on that you have in manufacturing to come up with real end-to-end -end solutions solving real-world problems. And I think here we made a good, good, we made good progress in getting a better understanding of what these end-to-end -end solutions may look like, but we need more and more of these solution bundles especially small manufacturers, right? They don't want to buy a 5G network from this player and maybe the service from another one and then a system integrator and then you have to somehow bring everything together. Ideally, there's a single point of contact offering you a complete solution solving your real world problem. So also partnerships are key here um, on the, the vendor side. Ease of use and cost efficiency, of course, if it's cheaper from the end user perspective, it's always a good thing. So that makes it easier to come up with a positive return on invest and ease of use so that the IT departments, for example, can easily manage it. And um, of course, with every new release, every new version of the standards, new value is coming um, and it may make it much easier then to come up with a, a positive business case as well. So I mentioned Hannover Messe 2024 already. So this will take place in, in April. Uh, 22nd to 26th of April in Hannover in Germany. So the biggest event if you want for the OT industry and would like to invite all of you to also join us there. Um, there will be this industrial 5G arena as well. Really a lot of talks, panel discussions, basically the entire week dedicated to the topic. Um, there is this central hotspot where you can then interact with many players offering solutions and services already. We will have a demo wall where we're showcasing um, many of the industrial 5G products that are available today. We are organizing a special media analyst event and so on. So a lot of exciting stuff and you will certainly have many more OTs there compared to Mobile World Congress, which is still very much ICT centric. So maybe the last slide that I want to show is um, we still have to do our homework for 5G, right? We are not quite there yet. At the same time, we already see at the horizon, there's this 6G thing coming up. So some people are talking about 6G already. Um, and of course, also in 5G, we were wondering, okay, what does this mean? And some people are asking, oh, should I wait then for 6G? <laughs> if it's now already being discussed, or should I get started with 5G? And of course, the answer is no, you should not wait for 6G because it will be an evolutionary process and 6G is still far away down the road, right? But what we should make sure is that the developments are going into the right direction. So that's why we already had some first contributions to discussions on the ITU level, for example, and also in we're preparing something for 3 pp just to make sure that also the interests of the manufacturing industry are considered basically from the very early days. And these are things, not necessarily even more demanding requirements in the terms of even lower latencies and so on. So here 5G is already fairly good if it's delivering on its promise. It's more about investment security, for example, things like this, or exposure, exposure of capabilities, so that these are things are considered from the early days. But there's certainly some lessons learned that we should take into account also in the further evolution of 5G towards 5G advanced and 6G. What is certainly important is the early involvement of the vertical industries in general, the OT industry in particular. And here now we have organizations like 5G SIA being able to do exactly this, right? So we have now a common language, we have coming forums, and we didn't have this at the beginning of the 5G developments. It's then also not just asking for even more demanding requirements, right? And for which use cases do you need less than one millisecond and so on? I think this is the wrong question. We really have to sit together to understand the problems end to end and then to see what solutions can be worked out to address these problems. Also this cost benefit analysis is important to do this early on, right? So what is the value of something and what is the cost? And then we have to jointly see, is it really worth it, right? And maybe sometimes it's, the answer is no. That means something should not be specified and, and be implemented. But then we also reduce the cost this way, reduce the effort this way, and we can maybe fully focus on other aspects. We should be realistic regarding capabilities and timeline. I think yeah, uh, what, what we also have seen with industrial 5G, of course, is a hype cycle, right? A big hype with some expectations that could not immediately be met. 
uh, because of course everybody was super excited in 2018, 2019. Now I think everybody understands things a bit better. We should not say make the same mistake again with 6G. And we should make sure we reduce this gap between what is in the standards and the implementation early on. Also here with 5G now we are on a good way. With 6G um, we should make it even better from the very beginning. So I skipped the last slide because I'm already over time, but it's um, also just a preview. Um, and then just some short remarks again on the next 5G SIA meetings, also to invite you again to join us. But if you have an interest to join and to become part of these discussions and ecosystem development and so on, you are always more than welcome to join us as a guest at first. So we will have um, an, uh, our next plenary meeting in March, in two weeks from now, or one and a half weeks. This will be a virtual meeting, so very easy to join but not so engaging like the face-to-face -face ones that we will be in Austin um, in June, in Beijing in September, and in Nuremberg in Germany in December. So maybe one of these meetings will be close to you. And with that, um, I'm at the end of my presentation. Thanks a lot for coming, and thanks a lot again to Analog Devices for the kind invitation. Of